Hey everyone, thank you for coming back for another episode of Behind the Curtain, Mysteries of the Past and Present. Um, If you were looking for a theater podcast, uh, stick around, because we're going to talk about the Bible instead. (laughs) You're out of luck, because this is theology. (laughs) Yeah, we have to say the whole name, because uh, there's like a dozen other behind the curtain. We didn't catch that, apparently, when we started this podcast. Nobody wants to listen to a Broadway podcast. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of people that do, apparently. Well, we're going to make believe like they don't exist. Yeah. So welcome to Behind the Curtain, a theology podcast. Okay, segue. (laughs) You know what does come up in... uh, in uh, pop culture and in um, in plays, and is uh, is true. What's that? Uh, mythology. Ooh, uh, gods yes. and religions and uh, myths that are true. Yeah, and I know someone that knows a lot about those topics. Right? Well, who who is it? Well, the illustrious Derek Gilbert. Derek Gilbert. Yeah, wouldn't it be great to have him as a guest? I think we should. I think well, we should. you're in luck. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> because we have Derek Gilbert on the show with us today. Yeah, this is a guy, I know y'all have heard us reference him before if you've been listening since the beginning, the first few episodes. Uh, he's somewhat of an expert. Uh, he, he he admits that he doesn't have a title. He talks about that when we interview him, but um, he spends all his time researching these ancient cultures and the connections with the gods and, uh, and the Bible and Yahweh and... Um, he's here to set the record straight oh, on yeah. some of the things. And in our last episode, we talked about Genesis six through 10. We're leading up to the tower of Babel. Right. And so he, he's going to discuss a little bit about towers mm-hmm. and about the gods of the nations. Yeah. He's going to give Nimrod. us kind of an overview of, man, what's going on in these chapters, yeah. maybe behind the scenes, some of the cultural things that are going on, the gods that are being worshiped. And... Yeah. That these are not made up beings for, right, for right. stories that you tell kids. These are. These are real entities that have an impact and influence yep. on society. People worship them. And so uh, and we even tap into a little bit of like how that story began and how it maybe kind of continues yeah. to today and yeah. in the future, maybe. Linking it to the modern day. Very, very interesting. Some uh, globalist agendas and, mm-hmm. and cults. And mm-hmm. Anyway, we're very, uh, we were very blessed to have him on the show. Yeah, yeah. And um, I feel like even, you know, we're looking forward to having him again because I don't think, like, I don't think we even. Barely scratched the surface on no, some of this his, stuff. No, his knowledge of these things is is almost infinite level, I would think. So we would have to call him <laughs> back again and infinite. get him back on. He's a scholar in my book, Ryan, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. he's written, uh, between him and his wife, He his wife is also very involved. He, he gives his whole resume in this interview. He does, yeah. But he's written things like... Uh, uh, the Great Inception. Mm-hmm. We've referenced that before on the great, show. Great stuff. Um, the Second Coming of Saturn is his most recent book, yep. where he talks about Saturn and the connections to the Satan in yep. in the Bible. Yep. Um, great stuff, man. He's got he's got a lot of books, so you need to buy them all and read them all. Yep. But we had the privilege of talking to him today, and it was fantastic. So make sure you stay tuned. Yep, and uh, we'll be back after the interview to give you a little uh, heads up on what to expect for the next couple episodes. back welcome back to behind the curtain uh, here we are i'm We're ryan on. this is josh and today hey. we have a very special guest with us yeah. this is Derek gilbert um uh, he has done a ton of research on uh, the the gods of the nations the tower of babel the ancient world um the the historical places and people connecting the stories in the bible to the real world um it's it. We're really looking forward to today. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, why don't you take a moment and just tell the audience? You know, Josh and I are pretty familiar with with yep. your material and your work and stuff. But why don't you tell the audience just a minute what uh, what you do, um, what all you're involved in? I started looking, and you've written tons of books. <laughs> you're host on Skywatch TV. You've got a yep. podcast. You've got a Gilbert you know, House. Yeah, yep. just a ton of stuff. So tell us about what you do and, and where to find find you uh, online. Well, the, the best place to find what Sharon and I do is our website, gilberthouse.org. Um, we've had that website since about 2003, but only the last uh, year or so has it really 
Uh, well, uh, I don't, you know, the last year or so, we've really ramped up and, and sort of made it a web hub for everything that we do. We, we've been blogging since about 2002. Um, and uh, so she had a blog, I had a blog, then we set up a, you know, Gilbert House as sort of a, uh, you know, a catch-all. And then we had uh, our podcast website. And then I started doing an interview podcast. So we set up that website. And then we uh, launched, uh, after coming here to the Ozarks to partner with Skywatch TV, we launched Unraveling Revelation. So that got a website and then Cy Friday got a website. Suddenly we've got like nine websites and it's like, um, you know, it'd be easier if we just sent everybody to one place and just sort of linked from there. So, uh, gilberthouse.org is where we, uh, uh, put most of our stuff. We, we do a weekly Bible study on Sundays, which is recorded as a podcast. And this grew out of meeting people at conferences who were telling us that, um, we, you know, we were just saying that they couldn't find a, a church that was teaching verse by verse uh, scripture, exegesis, verse by verse. And, and so we we're like, well, okay, we can do that, you know, because we'd, we'd been sort of podcasting about some of the, the conspiratorial aspects of uh, geopolitics and theopolitics, you know, the principalities and powers behind the scenes. Right. So um, we just started in on the book of Genesis. We've been all, all the way through the Bible once now. And now we're on our second trip through and seeing a lot more things the second time through. Um, but, you know, th this all started when we, we just decided to start writing back in the uh, early 2000s, taking part in a, uh, an annual challenge called National Novel Writing Month, which was a, a challenge put out by this group in San Francisco to people to uh, see if they could write 50,000 words in the course of 30 days. Well, Sharon found that to be no problem. I think I got to 25,000, really struggled. <laughs> Man. And uh, that became her first novel, Winds of Evil. Um, what I wrote eventually became my first novel called Iron Dragons, which is sort of a sci-fi fantasy mashup with uh, sort of a, a, a subtle, not too overt um, religious theme to it, Christian theme to it, in the sense of, uh, say, um, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Not that I'm comparing myself to Tolkien. There is no comparison to J.R.R. <laughs> Tolkien. No, he's but, phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, and, but, you know, Sharon came up with the concept and the title and I went from there. And because I'd not been a fan of fantasy normally, I, that's why I did a lot of science fiction elements into it. Um, but, but eventually that led to, okay, um, our, our publisher, because uh, we pitched a series of novels to a Christian publisher of uh, writing together, but separately. In other words, we would each write our own standalone novels, but in the same fictional universe. So we've got some characters that we would share back and forth and plot points and things. And they thought, well, that was really interesting. So they published uh, Winds of Evil and they published her second novel, The Armageddon Strain. And they were working on my novel, The God Conspiracy, when they started getting cold feet. You guys have UFOs and crop circles and <laughs> stuff in here. And, and I think what really turned them off was government conspiracies like FEMA camps and things. Uh, yeah. And, uh, they weren't, you know, government conspiracies weren't as popular with Christians when George W. Bush was the president. Mm, yeah. So we, we parted ways. Um, but that got us into podcasting because our publisher said, well, you need to find a way to podcast or, or do something to promote your, your can, can you can you do a television show? Now, this is back in 2005, 2004, 2005, like television show. I mean, who's got, you know, it's, it's not like today where you've got webcams that shoot in 4K and, uh, you know, our, our studio camera for our weekly Unraveling Revelation program is this right here, the iPhone 12, uh, because the camera is good enough that you can shoot video for broadcast on it. Um, that wasn't the case 17 years ago. So we, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a former radio broadcaster. I, I started broadcasting in, in, in when I was in college, worked my way through college really doing radio, and then continued in radio, uh, top 40 from my graduation in 1984 until the early 90s, and then realized it was a lousy way to raise a family, but uh, drew on that experience in early 2005 to start podcasting. The code for podcasting had only just been released like October of 2004. So six months later, we were podcasting in March of 2005 Thanks. with, you know, we, we joke like two tin cans and a string, but it was almost like wow. that. It yeah. was, you know, we <laughs> were using uh, Plantronics uh, gamer headsets with a, a Y splitter that plugged into uh, a MacBook. And yeah. uh, we, we had to figure it all out. It, it sounds awful. It yeah. That's awesome. Um, but we still have some of those old archives on the, uh, on the web and on our, our mobile app. But it, so anyway, our first show was why people should listen or should buy our books. Then it's like, okay, what do we do next week? 
Mm. So then we started interviewing people. Okay, let's 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 talk to people doing the kind of research we've been following that uh, have led to these these books. So that's how we made contact with Mike Heiser, with Tom Horn, with L.A. Marzulli, with Steve Quayle, uh, Guy Malone. Um, and so that became what we called PID Radio, Peering Into Darkness, which uh, is really one of the oldest podcasts on the internet. Um, we, we kind of got spotty with our, with our frequency once we got um, busy doing conferences and so forth, but that's what led to going to prophecy conferences. We were interviewing all of these speakers and uh, we got to know Tom Horn. We were asked to speak at a conference in Ohio, and that's where we met Tom Horn for the first time. That was back in 2010. He um, apparently liked what we were doing. And so when they set up their first future Congress, Prophecy Conference in Branson, they asked us, uh, you know, invited us to come down and set up and interview people. And then somebody had the bright idea to put a video camera in the room, and then they created DVDs, you know, extras for the DVD set out of those interviews. Um, and it just, you know, that led to being invited to speak at those conferences, which led to Tom inviting us to come out to the Ozarks when he was getting ready to put Skywatch TV on the air, which led to, hey, I need you to write a book. Like, okay, <laughs> I haven't done anything nonfiction yet, but that led to The Great Inception, which led to, you know, let's see how many books now. I've got nine book covers on the wall. You have a lot. <laughs> three three, three co-authored. And, and the funny thing is we feel like we're we're not as productive as we would like to be. Um, but the research is so interesting. You know, and Sharon and I are such nerds that for us, I mean, a high point of this, this time since we've been here in the Ozarks now going on eight years, um, is, is been some of the research trips that Tom Horn has allowed us to take. You know, we were in Roswell mm, for yeah. the 70th anniversary of the Roswell crash. We, we were, we went to London. We got to spend a day at the British museum. I mean, you know, there are other people who go awesome. there. It's like, okay, uh, boring, boring. And we're like, oh my gosh, it's the yeah. Sutton Who helmet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, did you did you meet up with Guy Malone? I've talked to him online a little bit. Yes, yes, we met with, yeah. with him at uh, in in Roswell. Yeah. Um, and uh, in fact, we did an interview for our Sci Friday program, standing in front of the uh, standing in front of Doctor Who's TARDIS. Nice. Oh, wow. Now, I, so, I followed uh, I followed Alien Resistance when it was uh, when it was around, and that's how I, that's how I got introduced to Heiser. Right. Yeah. But yeah, great and, stuff. And so you know, we were crossing paths with people who had these same kind of weird interests. Um, wait a minute, these guys are Christian and they're yeah. theologically conservative, and yet they're addressing subjects like the UFO phenomenon. Right. Yeah. Right, Chuck right. Missler. We've had the opportunity to interview Chuck mm, a couple of wow. times before he passed. Uh, Gary Stearman, who has now shared some of his uh, experiences as a pilot, you know, the, the, the missing time. When you're a pilot and you don't remember a big chunk of the flight you just, you know, taken, uh, that, that could be pretty scary. So um, being around these people has been a real blessing. But also, you know, Tom, we, we can't say enough good things that we got has worked through Tom to put Sharon and I on the path that we're on now. Um, to, to do this kind of research and try to bring this information to... Uh, to people in the pews. I mean, Mike Heiser was one of our first interviews back in 2005. And his divine counsel concept, when we read that, and I, sh you know, we, we were reading it, you know, back and forth, Sharon and I, it's like, this makes so much sense. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Suddenly we began to understand it. And when we start applying this to events in the Bible, things suddenly make a lot more sense. Yeah. You know, why did the Red Sea crossing happen and why did it happen where it happened? Um, you know, why was Jesus baptized in a specific location? You know, things like this make a lot more sense when you suddenly see the world through the eyes of the apostles and the prophets. And that's what Mike has been doing since he began his ministry. And we're just trying to take that and just apply it and share that as much as we can. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that, I love that. And I, I find that Josh and I started this podcast a few months ago and we, we really it's a hobby for us. You know, we, we put a little bit of effort into it, but we kind of said, you know, we we started having these discussions, just like you're saying about aliens and conspiracy theories and uh, angels and demons and this kind of stuff. And, you know, we, we were like, man, other people there, are, we know people that would be interested in this material if it was available to them. So we were like, well, we'll do the podcast cause it'll be fun for us. But if it blesses people uh, then, you know, it will, it'll be great. 
And, and you never know how that's going to happen because we've heard from people who said that because they stumbled across our podcast on some weird subject or topic, they were introduced to people like Mike Heiser or L.A. Marzulli or whatever. And suddenly the Bible is making sense. You know, the weird parts of the Old Testament that you can't make sense of. Why did God do these things to those poor Canaanites just because they weren't Israelites? Why did God? Well, when you understand the spiritual war that was taking place, you know, outside the limits of human vision, suddenly those things do make sense. Um, so yeah, it, it, there, there are occasionally people who will say that these topics are so fringe and we should just be focusing on Jesus. You know, this, this should all be about Jesus. It's like, and we agree, yes, it is all about Jesus. But when Jesus was baptized, and this is something that we, we just stumbled onto within the last like six months, he was baptized in the region of Bashan. Okay, the, the, the one place in Scripture where it tells us where Jesus was baptized is John chapter 1, verse 28. These things happened at Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Well, for 2,000 years, Christians have been trying to find that location. And back in 2015, UNESCO, United Nations, decided that it was the traditional site across from Jericho on the Jordan side of the river. And so the kingdom of Jordan, God bless them, they're spending $300 million to turn it into a, a, a tourist attraction. And that's fine. Jordan is a very impoverished country. They need the tourism dollars. They're very friendly people. We're going to be there in a month. And we're looking forward to going back to Mount Nebo and to Petra and to Wadi Rum and to seeing the Madaba map again. We'd love to go to the museum in Amman, Jordan. Um, there's another archaeological site there in, in Jordan we'd love to see near Mount Nebo called Tal El Hammam, which is the site of ancient Sodom. So God bless the people of Jordan. But there is no place called Bethany across the Jordan, which is why nobody's been able to find it. But in 1877, a scholar named uh, Claude Condor, who was sent by the British uh, Palestine Exploration Fund, uh, he was a military man, like a lot of their archaeologists, because the Ottoman Empire was crumbling and they wanted to see you know, what they could get their hands on when things fell apart. But they did a lot of good archaeology. And Condor wrote that the Greek Bethania was probably just an alternate spelling of the ancient Greek name Batania, which is Bashan. Well, Bashan across the Jordan, that's north of the Sea of Galilee. And then when you read in John and the other Gospels, you see that the first disciples Jesus called are all from Bethsaida or Capernaum, which is north of the Sea of Galilee. Wow. Yeah. So why would, you know, Andrew was like the first one to see, we found the Messiah, he goes to find Peter. Why would he be a disciple of John the Baptist 90 miles away if he's partners in a fishing business on the Sea of Galilee? Not going to happen. 90 miles. When you got to walk that distance, you're not going to walk that every day. It's not a commute you're going to make. No, all of this was taking place north of the Sea of Galilee. Why? Because that area was a giant necropolis. When you look at the dolmen fields in Bashan, which, as Mike Heiser you know, wrote about in Reversing Hermon, um, it was known to be, by the ancient world, a place that was evil. It's where, it was the entrance to the netherworld, essentially. Right, yeah, yeah. Covered with monuments to the dead. So but, and I'm, I'm rabbit trailing and taking up the you know, the whole program with this one no, story. No, that's all good stuff, but though. All, but we want to go ahead. For, yeah, let's yeah, go ahead first into those rabbit trails. Those are good. <laughs> but the bottom line is that Jesus saw that this was so important that he chose to be baptized there, that John was led to baptize there, not down near Jericho, in sight of Jerusalem, basically. It was there in the region, and, and Matthew writes this in Matthew chapter 4, when he writes about Jesus moving from Nazareth to Capernaum after John the Baptist got arrested, so that what was written by Isaiah would be fulfilled. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. Those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Yeah. The region and shadow, the region of shadow of death. The Jordan River is a valley that extends from Mount Hermon down to the Sea of Galilee and then continues down to the Dead Sea. We think that's the valley of the shadow of death. In fact, when you look at a map, and, and again, this is a kind of nerdy stuff that Sharon and I get really excited about. Yep. Israeli archaeologists just within the last four years published a paper on the dolmens that surround that valley north of the Sea of Galilee. And they quoted the guy who did the archaeological survey of the Golan Heights, which was the ancient kingdom of Bashan. And he said, we can't use the term 
Dolman field anymore because we don't know where one ends and where the next one begins. For all intents and purposes, the entire Golan Heights, in other words, the ancient kingdom of Og of Bashan was one giant necropolis. It was, and you can corroborate this with pagan text from the Canaanites dated to the time of the judges. That's where John was baptizing. Jesus went there. He called his disciples from there. And then three years later, when he went to Mount Hermon, to Caesarea Philippi, he declared his divinity at the base of that mountain. Yeah, uh, yeah. on this rock, this 9,200 foot right, mountain right. here, that's known to be the Mount of Assembly of the Canaanite pantheon. Um, I will build my church and the gates of hell, which is this really big cave over here, the Jordan yeah. River comes out of, yeah. will not prevail against it. And then, he, and then he and John and Peter and James climb the mountain for the transfiguration. So he declares his yeah. divinity at the base of the mountain, declares it again at the top of the mountain, and then he goes to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission. So yes, this should all be about Jesus, all of these weird topics, but yeah. Jesus showed through his ministry that this weird stuff was important. Right, very much. And there's a reason it's in the scriptures too. All those places and destinations and yes. all those distances, it's, it makes it makes the story real. To me, it makes it real. It's like, oh, wow, that's a real place. Like these things exist. Like, Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and next month, I mean, and we're going like a month from today as we're recording this, we're going to be on the plane, you know, landing at Ben Gurion Airport. And we're going a few days before the tour arrives so that we can go to some of these places and record some video so we can show this to people. Nice. It's like, look, th there's a megalithic site that hardly anyone knows about, um, about a mile north of the Sea of Galilee. It's on a little hill overlooking the Jordan River. It's called Kerbet Betaha. I had to ask our, uh, our friend Aaron Lipkin, who runs the tour company, how to pronounce it because <laughs> I had no clue. Yeah, how do you spell that? I don't get it. I'm going to look that up. <laughs> yeah. And you'll find very little on it on the web, which is the thing. I stumbled onto it in one of these academic papers that I like to read. And uh, what, what's really cool is the guy who wrote the paper about that site and about the most recent excavation at Gilgal Rephaim will be joining us for the day. We're like, oh. Oh, that's cool. I mean, nice. Yeah. So he pointed out that this site, Kerbet Betaha, is like, very similar to Gilgal Rephaim. It's, you know, concentric rings around a central tumulus, which is a big pile of rocks over a dolmen. And those dolmens are those big megalithic slabs with like a tabletop. I mean, that's what the word means in right, Britonic, right. which is a Celtic language. It means table. Yeah. So somebody was buried there. Now he did the most recent dig at Gilgal Rephaim and he dates it to about 3750 BC using a method called optically stimulated luminescence. They take undisturbed dirt from the in innermost core and they can determine based on the, uh, the radiation uh, or, or whatever. I, I don't understand the process. All I know is it's been validated. Uh, again, about 3750 BC, which means it's about 1200 years older than Stonehenge. And it's, uh, it's about half again more stone in terms of weight than Stonehenge. Well, this site at Kerbet Betaha is about a third the size, about 150 feet across instead of 500 feet across, but it's the same type of structure. And here's the thing. It's on the east side of the Jordan River, which means it's across the Jordan in the terms of the New Testament. And it's less than half a mile from Bethsaida, where Jesus called Nathaniel, Andrew, Peter, you know, his first, and yeah. Philip, his first four disciples are all from Bethsaida. There is no way they didn't know that that was there. And right. that was the region where John was baptizing. Mm. Wow. And, Jesus and that's something went that we there. just gloss over so easily. Oh, Jesus was baptized and you move on. Right. But it's right. so much stuff underneath the surface there that, that brings it to life so much more, so much depth. Yeah. So the only regret I have about this is that, uh, you know, I'm 61 years old now. So I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, okay, I could take the time out and take five or six years and go get a PhD in all of this. So I've got, you know, a, a doctorate behind my name, but I don't have that much time. I don't know how many years I've got left in this world. I would yeah. rather spend my time trying to communicate these things, trying to research it and yeah. relying uh -huh. on the work of guys who are credentialed scholars like this Dr. Michael Freakman, who's going to meet us in... Uh, uh, in Israel. Uh, we've got good friends who become uh, archaeologists who become good friends of ours. Dr. Scott Stripling, who found the lead curse tablet at uh, Joshua's oh. altar. Um, oh, I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Doug Petrovich, who's got a couple of just 
earth-shattering books, in my view, the world's oldest alphabet, where he shows, and origins of the Hebrews, where he shows that uh, the Hebrews had a written alphabet as early as 1800 BC in the Nile Delta. And he, he actually goes so far as to suggest it was the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, who developed it. Oh, wow. So, wow. yeah, I mean, it, this is the kind of thing that turns other scholars on their heads because, you know, these experts who've been, you know, chair of the Egyptology department of their university for 40 years. And then here comes this guy who says, wait, no, no, the Hebrews were writing an alphabetic script and we found the tablets in the Sinai Peninsula at a, at a turquoise mine, not a turquoise mine, uh, was something else they were mining. Maybe it was a turquoise mine. Anyway, but the Hebrew slaves or Hebrew workers who were working there were writing this stuff down and we can translate it. And look, this is a reference to Joseph's son, Manasseh. And this Jeez. is a reference. Wow. You know, and, and of course they're going to say, no, he's crazy. He's got no, because right. it upsets their apple cart. Right. But, yeah. but he makes a really good case. He's convinced Sharon and me, and we're not trying to be sensational about the things that we discuss when we talk about the Bible and the things that are in it, because the Bible is sensational enough, and we are not going to do our, any favors for our king if we're making stuff up, because we'll be caught out. I mean, there are atheists out there. There are skeptics out there. There are Christians who don't want to change their views on things. You know, the, the gods of the pagans in the ancient world were imaginary, and you're a, you're a heretic for saying otherwise. Okay, but, you know, God calls them gods in the Bible, so take it up with the author of the book, you know. But like I said, we, we get excited about these things, and we just want to bridge that gap between the scholars and their world and people just to say, look, this stuff is, I mean, our kids are getting hooked on like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or, or whatever, um, you know, Harry Potter or... or right. Right. You know, these larger than Percy life Jackson, figures. Percy Jackson right, and the right, Olympic. Right. And we, we get that. I mean, we, we love the Thor movies. You know, Chris Hemsworth is great. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 and we love us some kaiju movies too. You know, Godzilla and King of the Monsters. <laughs> oh, yeah. Old yeah. School. yeah. We, we've, we've watched those. You know, we've watched Godzilla King of the Monsters about seven times. Nice. Um, That's awesome. But, but you can, it's mainly to, yes okay well, there's an entertainment value there but we can also see the messaging that is in these films right, right, and hopefully right. we can also share that and communicate that i mean sharon has picked out some really incredible things on godzilla king of the monsters and the whole monster verse theme that's spun out there i don't yes. know if you guys have seen the movie but you know when they've got to go down to godzilla's underwater lair uh and, yeah because yeah. they've got to detonate the nuke to because godzilla eats radiation when they yeah. that it's like a one second clip as they're going past these these giant statues, those statues were rep they were replicas of the Lamasu, which were the giant human headed oh, yeah, yeah. bull winged bulls like the like the cherubim or whatever exactly exactly yeah. and so the messaging, which is all through that movie, is that these are the titans, the original and rightful rulers of Earth, and they must return. They must return to restore balance. So, yeah, we can watch those and, you know, just really cheer when Godzilla takes down Ghidorah or whatever. But yeah. at the same time, say, but understand the messaging that kids are getting. If you don't have a biblical worldview, right, right. you might be so caught up in the storyline that you start buying into some of the ideas. Mm. Man, you don't need to write a book on a, like a theology of monsters. That'd be fun. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad you said all that because, I mean, it, it's a little off topic from what we had planned. We've been going through Genesis and we got to Genesis 11. We had planned to talk about the Tower of Babel, but well, that's, that's this actually saying, fits together. This actually I, fits together. Yeah. Yeah. You you mentioned fantasy, sci-fi, Tolkien, aliens, uh, Godzilla, um, you know, these <laughs> things that just seem unreal and unnatural and it's fiction. It's for movies Star and books. Wars. And then, then you see these things in the Bible that you can't explain unless you dig a little deeper like this. So what are, what are people to think? Like a little while ago, you mentioned um, Mount Hermon and the Canaanite gods and the, the seats, the, the thrones and, and the council of, uh, you know, El, like you've talked about that. Mm -hmm. What are Christians to think of, of these things? Are these, these just myths or are they real? Do they have any kind of power? Or? Well, that's why we wrote the book giants, gods and dragons, Sharon and I, because we, we noticed a couple of years ago, there was a, uh, a news story that popped up that um, the company that, that produces, the uh, Dungeons and Dragons series of games. Yeah. Um, they had responded to some protests from some of the gamers who were upset that orcs 
were always depicted as evil. And that uh, orcs in the J.R., which were drawn from the J.R.R. Tolkien Lord of the Rings universe. Right. Um, if you understand the backstory of the orcs, they are angels, essentially. They were elves in, in Tol- Tolkien's world. Elves are like a cognate for angels in the, in the Bible, in biblical yeah, theology. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and they were twisted and tortured so that there was nothing good left in the orcs. They were just consummate evil. So these would be like fallen angels serving uh, m- more powerful fallen entities. Yeah, we talked um, a little bit about that for our Halloween episode. Do you remember, Ryan? We talked yeah. about the fairies and the nymphs and the elves and all that. And it comes, yeah, it's kind of full circle. Yeah, yeah, so good. So the the, the gamers were complaining that that the orcs were were always depicted as having colored skin. And so it must be a racist thing because the elves <laughs> in Tolkien's world were always depicted as fair skinned and white haired and, and whatever. And so it wasn't right that the orcs should be depicted this way. And so the, uh, the company wizards of the coast decided to uh, change the rules in upcoming editions of the game where people could choose to play the orcs as good if they so chose. All right. We could laugh at that and say, look, these people have just lost the plot. I mean, because first of all, they don't know the backstory. Tolkien, in Tolkien's world, he created them and they were they were irredeemable. They were evil. That's just it. There was nothing raci- racial about it. But then I then it occurred to me that we Christians, for the most part, when you look at survey after survey, don't really believe that most of the characters described in the Bible are real. 60 per, 60% of American Christians don't believe that Satan is real, don't believe that the Holy Spirit is real, and forget about demons. We quit believing in demons when we discovered psychology. So we Christians have no grounds to point our fingers and laugh at the woke gamers complaining that Dungeons and Dragons is discriminating against the orcs because they're you know complaining that these fictional characters aren't being treated fairly, while at the same time we're ignoring these literal characters that God in the Bible describes as giants, gods, dragons, who want to destroy us. So that's, that's why we look at these uh, forms of entertainment and say, look, they're kind of rebranding these entities that God in the Bible describes and calls evil. I mean, in Exodus 12, when he's telling Moses that he's going to send an angel through the land of Egypt and kill all the firstborn that night. And he said, then he adds, and I will also execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Well, if they're imaginary, if they're not real, then why does he bother? I mean, I'm going to beat up a bunch of, you know, lifeless blocks of wood and stone. That makes no sense. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of people would argue that that's a symbolic thing, right? So you're saying these are real entities, the, the Egyptian gods. Well, yeah, especially when you put that, compare that with the Psalms, like Psalm 82 or Psalm 89, especially Psalm 82, which is like a courtroom scene in heaven, right. where God makes it very clear that uh, the entities that he had entrusted to administer his creation, and these are probably the entities, uh, not the same group that uh, are described in Genesis chapter 6, the uh, sons of God who saw that the daughters of man were fair and took wives of any they chose. Um, We read in Deuteronomy 32, and again, this is coming from Mike Heiser, um, verse 8, Moses says, when God divided the nations, that's after Babel, he numbered them according to the number of the sons of God. Now, King James reads sons of Israel, but the oldest Copies of the book of Deuteronomy make it clear, the sons of God, which is a reference to supernatural entities, angels, if, if you like. So in Psalm 82, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. Now, who is this is usually explained away as uh, God addressing human rulers who are ruling his people unjustly. But the fact is, the word translated gods... And then again in verse 6, God speaking, I said, you are gods, you are Elohim, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. If he's speaking to humans, that makes no sense. But very simply, the word translated gods, Elohim, in Hebrew always means supernatural entities. It never refers to humans. So Bible teachers, God bless them, who've been looking at this and for years trying to explain it away, 
are just telling Hebrew speakers that they don't know their own language. I mean, it, God literally holds court and says, you are ruling unjustly, and so even though you are gods, you will die like men. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry that you, you, if, uh, if people have a problem with that, this is not me making this up. This was the understanding of Jews of the Second Temple period. This was the early church. This is what the language means. And if you're a Christian yeah. and you believe that the Bible is the word of God that's been preserved accurately for more than 2,000 years, in this case, this Psalm 3,000 years, take it up with the author. Right, yeah, definitely. <laughs> We're not trying to make up a new weird way of making the Bible more exciting. We're trying to go back to understanding it the way the prophets and the apostles understood it. Right, this exactly. isn't a big rebranding project. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, see, that's why we love you, Derek. Uh, your, your research is really in-depth. It's really wide. You have a super amount of knowledge. This is just insane. I think the only thing you need to do left is just run for president or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but, uh, but we've been going through the book of Genesis, you know, and we've gotten to this, this part of, you know, Genesis seven through 11, with the tower of Babel and Nimrod. And the first person we thought of was Derek Gilbert. And we're well, like, we've got to get his perspective on this. What was going on with Babel? Who is Nimrod? Why is he important? Um, I would right. love to hear that overview of, of what's going on in that time there. Well, this is something that we've written uh, a little bit about in our books. I mean, going back to my first book, The Great Inception, uh, Babel was a, an artificial mountain. And the, the point of that first book, The Great Inception, was that most of the really important supernatural events in the Bible happened at or near mountains or artificial mountains. So you had... Uh, Eden, which was, um, well, Ezekiel 28, you know, it was the mountain, mountain of God. Yeah, it's a garden, but it's the mountain of God. Then you've got, uh, you know, Mount, you've got the, uh, Mount Hermon, where uh, according to the extra canonical, extra biblical book of First Enoch, that's where these gr this group of, of sons of God came down and decided to corrupt humanity. Um, and there are little references to Hermon all through the Old Testament. And if you understand that that's what was going on, those References suddenly make more sense, and references to Bashan too, like, like in Psalm Psalm twenty two, when uh, which is the messianic psalm that begins with the verses that Jesus quotes on the cross: "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" And then later he says, "You know, bulls of Bashan surround me, strong bulls of Bashan." He's not talking about, and I love this. This is a line by a scholar named Dr. Robert Miller. He's not referring to the bovine, but to the divine. Yeah, Bashan. At the point of his paper, he wrote a paper, which is wonderful, called The Bales of Bashan. And he went and actually used agronomy and, uh, and archaeology to show that you cannot grow enough grass in Bashan because of the type of soil to support livestock or cattle. Anyway, you can support goats, you can support sheep, but forget cattle. There were no bulls of Bashan. There were no fat cows of Bashan, like in the book of Amos. These were supernatural entities. And uh, if you look at the iconography, the, the images used to depict the gods of Mesopotamia, they all had horns. So yeah. So anyway, you had that mountain, you've got uh, Mount Sinai, where of course God gave the law to Moses. You had uh, Babel, which was the artificial mountain. Uh, you had uh, uh, the, the mountain in the north that was the mountain of Baal called Mount Saphon, which is it was so important in Israel's history. That's why the, that word, Zaphon, is now the Hebrew word for the compass point north. In every other Semitic language related to Hebrew, it's Simal, which means left. Because as you're facing east, you know, right is Yamin, that means south. So Benjamin or Ben Yamin means son of the right hand or southerner. Yeah. So Benu, the, the ben, ben Simal, sons of the left hand, the northerners. Uh, but in Hebrew, it's Tsephon, because that's where Baal's palace was located, and he was the king of the gods of their pagan neighbors. So again, it, very important. Um, and you know, even down to uh, like the modern era where you got Muhammad receiving his uh, revelation at a, uh, a mountain called Jebel al-Nur. So um, his revelation coming from the wrong side of the tracks, sadly. Um, the, the, thing, the thing we need to understand about Babel, though, is that it was not at Babylon. Nimrod is often blamed for the occult wickedness of Babylon. You know, Babylon was very proud that it had preserved 
knowledge from the, the Apkalu, which is what the Mesopotamians called the Watchers. And uh, they're, they're magicians and they're, they're uh, you know, soothsayers and fortune tellers or whatever. They had preserved all of this occult knowledge. But Nimrod was not connected to Babylon. Babel sounds like Babylon. It's rooted in the same word. In Akkadian, it's Bab Elu, which means gate of God or gate of the gods. But the name Babylon was applied to a number of cities in the ancient, uh, in the ancient Near East. And that term, ancient Near East, refers to the lands of the Bible. If you look at a map today, that's like Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, northern Saudi Arabia, you know, Turkey, and, the parts of Turkey and Iran that are around that. That's the ancient Near East. His, uh, th- this, this um, term Babylon was applied to cities like, like Nineveh. It was applied to the city that we're going to talk about here called Eridu. Uh, because again, these were all sacred places and every city in the ancient world had a, uh, a patron god or patron deity. Um, Babylon wasn't founded really until about 2300 BC. Nimrod, according to the Bible, was uh, his kingdom was based at Erek, which is uh, just an alternate spelling of the ancient city of Uruk, which is just an alternate spelling of the name of the country today, Iraq. I mean, isn't it bizarre that 100 years ago when they were dividing up Mesopotamia after World War I, they decided to name the country after the kingdom of Nimrod, which I don't think is coincidental. Anyway, they said that uh, his, his kingdom was... Uh, and this was in Genesis 10, actually. Uh, Nimrod was the first on earth to be a mighty man, a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Uh, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Um, Uruk was a very powerful city-state that dominated Mesopotamia for a period of about 900 years, in uh, roughly 4,000 BC down to about 3,100 BC. That city, which is now in southeast, or what is now southeast Iraq, dominated everything between the Tigris and the Euphrates from the Persian Gulf all the way to the mountains of Turkey. In fact, those areas right now where the Euphrates reaches into those mountains that were just hit by that uh, earthquake last week, that was all under the control of Uruk. One, we were planning a tour of Turkey in October, I don't know that it's going to happen this year now because we just don't know what the infrastructure is going to be like. But one of the sites we were planning to visit called uh, uh, Aslan Tepe is the northernmost outpost of the kingdom of Uruk. And we wanted to visit that just to show people, look, the the Persian Gulf is like, um, I don't know, like 700 miles that way. And yet this kingdom more than 5,000 years ago dominated the world all the way up here from down at the Persian Gulf. That's what the kingdom of Uruk was. So Nimrod, historically, if you're going to find him and his kingdom and somebody from Uruk who could control the people of Mesopotamia and put them to work on this huge building project, it would be during that period of history that scholars call the Uruk expansion or the Uruk period. So that ended again around 3100 BC, which is like 800 years before the city of Babylon was even built. And Babylon didn't even become a great city until the time of Hammurabi, who began to reign around 1790 BC. Yeah. So, you know, Nimrod's in the wrong millennium and, <laughs> and in the wrong place. Um, and, and, you know, Babylon is quite a bit further north from, uh, from where uh, this, this place was. Uh, but you notice in, in Genesis 10, it says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, or Bab Elu, the God Gate, and Uruk. There's this ancient city that uh, was known from Sumerian texts, their king lists, as the first city where kingship first came down from heaven, or was lowered from heaven, and that is Eridu. Eridu is not far from Uruk. It's what used to be on the the, the coast of the uh, the Persian Gulf, the shore of the Persian Gulf, uh, because of silt now, it's like 75 miles inland. But um, there was a temple there for a deity named Enki. Enki is a compound word that means Lord, En, and Ki, earth, Lord of the earth. God of this world, maybe? Yeah. Jesus used that term, yeah. But the temple that they located there, uh, when they dug at Eridu back in 1949, a team just after World War II dug and found that... Um, 
the temple of Enki, which was called the Iabzu, which means House of the Abyss, was the oldest temple in Mesopotamia. That goes back to about 5000 BC, the, the earliest stages of it, you know, level 18, the very lowest level. And it was like a little small 10 by 10 room, the size of a bedroom. But as time went on, it got bigger and bigger and more important. And Enki was one of the most important gods in Mesopotamia. He was a god who was um, the only one in the Mesopotamian pantheon who was considered friendly to humans all the time. According to the myths and stories, he controlled what were called the, the Mez. It's spelled M-E-S. looks like Mez, but it's Mez. And those were the principles that guided human civilization. Everything from, you know, be nice to your neighbor to how to make beer. You know, everything was in there on that list. Yeah. Um, according to one story, at, at, at one point, the goddess Inanna, the goddess Inanna, who was in one story his niece, you know, another story his cousin, it depends on who wrote the story and when, she got him drunk. She came down from her city of Uruk down to Eridu, um, and she got him drunk, and she stole the Mez. So she wound up in control of these things. But the Mez had been taken to humans by the Apkalu, again, the watchers of Mesopotamia. And they came from the abyss, the Apsu, because the name Apkalu actually means, uh, Ap meaning um, uh, uh, water, like abyss, Kal or Gal meaning big, and then Lu meaning man, big water man is essentially what that means. Ha. Huh. <laughs> But a scholar by the name of Amar Anus, an Estonian scholar, showed, no, uh, you know, gosh, about 10, 12 years ago, that the way they were depicted in Mesopotamian texts and the way they're depicted in the Hebrew Second Temple literature, like the book of First Enoch, shows that uh, the watchers of the Hebrews were essentially the Apkalu of the Mesopotamians, just from a Hebrew perspective. Right. Whereas the Mesopotamians said, okay, they could perform witchcraft and sorcery. Sometimes they were good, sometimes they were not. In the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew mind, in Hebrew religion, the watchers who came down on Mount Hermon, all bad. And yeah. the stuff that they taught the, uh, the, the Mesopotamians that the Babylonians were so proud of, like witchcraft and sorcery and divining the future, Jews were like, that was forbidden. And that's why they are chained up in the abyss. Yeah. And of right. course, yeah. Peter and Jude make reference to that in their, uh, in their letters, 2 Peter 2 that's and also right. Jude verses 6 and 7. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you think that Genesis um, in these chapters um, is a polemic to these stories that were seem to be hijacked from uh, the biblical narrative? I mean, there wasn't a biblical narrative at the time, but the story of God and what's going on. Do you think it was hijacked by these other nations and these other gods? And Genesis yeah. is like a polemic to say, no, 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 no. Those are not right. Here's the real story. Exactly. Exactly, Josh. That's that's what it is. It's critics, of course, skeptics will say, well, no, because we know that the Hebrew text is newer, even if they grant that Moses wrote these, you know, the first five books of the Bible in or around 1400 BC, they'll still say these are much newer than the Sumerian, the Akkadian and Sumerian texts that uh, preceded them. So the Hebrews must have stolen their religion from the Mesopotamians. It's like, yeah, except, except that Yahweh of the Bible is the only deity in the ancient Near East who was omnipotent, omniscient, you know, all powerful. I'm repeating myself because that's what omnipotent means. Omnipresent was the other word I was trying to think of. The gods of the Mesopotamians, the gods of the, the Hittites, the Hurrians, the Greeks and Romans, the Egyptians, none of them were omnipotent and none of them were perfect. They would squabble and fight and, and uh, you know, get, get even with one another and scheme and, and plot and, and make mistakes, just like humans. That is not ever how Yahweh is depicted. New Testament, Old Testament, that is not the God of the Bible. He is the only one who is depicted as pre-existing all things, having brought it all into existence, and the one who will restore things at the end of time. That is completely different from how... So, so if skeptics want to make that claim, they need to explain that key difference. Instead, they kind of gloss over it. Oh yeah, Jesus is just, you know, Osiris or, you know, right, he's right, right. whatever. I I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're, you're leaving out key details in order to try to make a point. Right. So this is exactly what it is. This is, 
correcting the fake news version of history that the right, pagans yeah. misinformation, have been given. Misinformation, ancient misinformation. Right. <laughs> now, what's really fascinating is when you look at the historical evidence, and again, the archaeologists who worked on this uh, site in 1949 found that some of the oldest levels of this temple to Enki were below an eight-foot thick layer of silt. Now, what could deposit an eight-foot thick layer of silt? Maybe a big flood? Yeah, maybe. Just speculating there. Water. Yeah. They also found that when you got to the very top level, um, this n top level of the, the, the temples, which were built one on top of another, when it started to crumble, because mud brick doesn't last forever, they would just kind of level it off and then start building on top of the fill. They found that this would have been the largest ziggurat or step pyramid in all of Mesopotamia. Bigger wow. than the great ziggurat of Ur, which was uh, the temple of the yeah. moon god at the city of Ur. Bigger than the um, Edamananki, which is the temple of Marduk in Babylon. This temple to the god Eridu, or to the god of Eridu, Enki, directly above the Absu, the abyss, was the oldest and would have been the largest, except that it was never completed. The scholars wrote in this report from 1949, which you can find online if you uh, search hard enough, they said that at the end of the Uruk period, again, right around 3100 BC, for some unknown reason, construction was abandoned and the site was very quickly covered over by drifting sand. Now, it was later uncovered and refurbished around 2300 BC, but this, it was never, it was never built up the way it had been intended in 3100 BC. Now, what could that be? Sounds like Genesis 11. Therefore, yeah, they, they, they left off building the city. God dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. What's really interesting is that there is a poem that hints at this event. It's called Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata, A-R-A-T-T-A. -T -T -A. Enmerkar, in the Sumerian king list, is described as being the second king of Uruk after the flood swept over. Second king of Uruk after the flood swept over. Well, if you look at Genesis chapter 10, Nimrod is second generation after the flood. Son of Cush, who was the son of, uh, son of uh, Ham. Um, in this poem, Enmerkar and this king of Arata, who we, uh, we get his name in another biblical text, and it's really long and impossible to pronounce. Uh, Arata, scholars have not come to a consensus as to where that land was located, but it may be a cognate, which means same word, different language, for the kingdom of Urartu, which is around where modern Armenia is. Could also be a cognate, uh, just a different spelling for Ararat, okay, which is where Noah's Ark came to rest. According to this poem, this, this epic poem, Enmerkar, who was the king of Uruk, and this lord of Arata, possibly Ararat, we're arguing over which one was the favorite of the goddess Inanna. Okay, Inanna, Ishtar, Astarte of the Bible, Aphrodite to the Greeks, Venus to the Romans, uh, Ketesh to the to the Egyptians, uh, Shaushka to the to the Hurrians and the Hittites. She's she's had a really long run. Um, nowadays, there are some who refer to her without even knowing it as Queen of Heaven. She, she, is, she is not Mary. Let's, let's be very clear about that. She is not Mary, but she would appropriate that title for herself. She's referred to in, in the Bible in um, Ezekiel or Jeremiah, I forget which, makes reference to uh, offering raisin cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Yeah. That's who we're talking about here. She was a goddess of carnality, sex, and war. And she's the first gender fluid entity, as far as we know, on planet Earth. Sumerian hymns praise her for being able to change men into women and women into men, and her temple followers were. Oh. Were, is, that, is that the statue that they built out in front of uh, the New York courthouse? Yeah, I did a program on that a couple of weeks ago. Yes, we think that's who that represents. Uh, definitely. Wow. <laughs> so oh, the dots yeah, are I mean, connecting. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's astonishing when you think about her influence on the ancient world. I mean, you think about this. I mean, this was going on in 3100 BC, and this, this poem refers probably to this incident. Again, the archaeologists confirm that this top level of this temple to the god Enki, which I believe is a Tower of Babel, was the, the, never finished, and that coincided with the collapse of the Empire of Uruk around 3100 BC. So 
3100 BC, you go 1700 years down to the time of Moses when he comes down from Mount Sinai with the law saying, okay, don't uncover your father's nakedness, which is a way of saying in the ancient world, don't have sex with your father's wife, which is what Ham did when he uncovered Noah's nakedness. He didn't, he didn't lift up his robe and get a peek. He basically, this was what Reuben, Jacob's firstborn did with his concubine Bilhah. This is what Absalom did when he rebelled against uh, David yeah. and he took his concubines on the, on the roof of the palace. He was uncovering his father's nakedness to basically say, I'm the man, dad is old, he can't stop me. I'm now the one in control. I have the family business. That's what this was all about. Anyway, that's well, the that, kind of thing that Inanna was inspiring in the pagans of the ancient world. But that's the kind of that's the kind of morality that was accepted in the ancient Near East until Moses came down the mountain in 1400 BC. I mean, isn't it ironic that today we are being hit with all of these so-called progressive ideas about gender when in fact it's actually regressive? I mean, Inanna, there are, there are, there's a hymn in which Inanna is, uh, you know, says, though I am a young woman, when I sit in the, in the tavern, I am an exuberant young man. The Hurrians depicted their version of Urshauska at a very uh, famous set of inscriptions where they depicted the, the Hurrian pantheon. The Hurrians were a people, um, they're mentioned in the Bible as the Horites. They occupied like the Kurdish regions of northern Syria, northern Iraq, uh, but they started out in the plains of Ararat. Okay, interesting. And they moved down into Mesopotamia from there. Um, they depicted all of their, their pantheon with the male gods on one side and the female goddesses on the other. Well, Shauska, who was their equivalent of Inanna, is on both. That's, that's, that's who she is. Well, this is who Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata are arguing over. And Enmerkar wants this Lord of Arata somewhere in what is now eastern Turkey, western Armenia, to send him building materials. Because well, you got a lot of sand and a lot of mud in southeast Iraq. It's very marshy. You don't have stone. You don't have timber. So that's why Uruk expanded north along those rivers so they could get those building materials. You also don't have metal. There's a lot of um, copper in uh, the Taurus Mountains. And you can't make bronze for sharp, pointy objects for weapons if you don't have metal. So that's what they were doing up there. Anyway, bottom line is he wanted to build the uh, temple of Inanna, and it appears that this, this entity, or th this king, Enmerkar, who I think is Nimrod, built up that temple to Inanna and replaced the sky god, Anu, as the patron deity of Uruk with Inanna. So this, this is who was essentially his patron god slash goddess, Inanna. Anu, who had been like the creator god, but he'd been kind of pushed out, he's sort of semi-retired, and Enlil became the king of the gods until Marduk came along. Um, but Inanna wanted to control everything, which is why she went, got her uncle drunk, and stole the mez to give her control over, you know, all of the principles that guided human civilization. And then following the epic of Gilgamesh, where she wanted the, the hero Gilgamesh to worship her and uh, marry her, and he pointed out that bad things always happen to guys that got involved with Inanna, she, get, she got mad. Anyway, there's a, the following story. She goes down to the netherworld and tries to get control of the netherworld from her sister, Ereshkigal, who was the queen of the great below. She was the queen of heaven. She got control of the Mez to take over the earth, and she wanted to be the queen of the underworld as well. That's who Nimrod made his patron deity at the city of Uruk. But then the poem goes on this Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata, where he wants more building materials so that he can build up the e Absu, the house of the abyss, into a gleaming mountain and abode of the gods. That's the money quote. He wanted to make the temple directly over the abyss, the abode of the gods. And that poem even then continues and remembers that the language of Sumer, the plains of Shinar in the Bible, where everyone had spoken with a single tongue had been confused. The speech had been confused. Now, Enki takes credit for it in the poem. Again, that's a fake news version. But the fact that they remember these details, the building of a tower, a temple, directly above the Absu, a Bab Elu, a God gate, 
that was stopped, according to the archaeologists, before it was completed. And afterward, the speech was uh, the speech of the people, which formerly had spoken with a single tongue, was now confused. We've got archaeological evidence that points to this being a real historical fact happening sometime around 3100 BC. Now, again, why did Nimrod try to do it? What did he think he could accomplish? I don't know. Did he really think he could open up the abyss? Because the gods who had formerly walked with humanity, the old gods or the former gods, were no longer walking with humanity. These were the sons of God from Mount Hermon. And even in the time of the, uh, uh, the, the Babylonian kingdom, you know, the time of Abraham around 1800 BC, they knew that you know, a, a three-month walk away, Mount Hermon was a sacred place. I mean, there were closer mountains in Iran. You go east into Iran, and there are taller mountains in Iran. Mount Hermon is pretty tall, 9,200 feet, but it's not even among the 100 tallest mountains on planet Earth. Many of those in Iran are among those 100 tall. Why not there? Because there was something about Mount Hermon that was special. The Epic of Gilgamesh, when he and his buddy Enkidu have to go destroy the monster Huawa, they, they, after killing this monster, they go deeper into the cedar forest of Mount Hermon to penetrate the secret dwelling of the Anunnaki. Who were they were they were formerly the chief gods of Mesopotamia, but by the time of Abraham, they had been sort of demoted to become judges in the netherworld. And it's 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 like it's all the same story, but it's different perspectives with embellishments with whatever camp you're in. You know, right? It's amazing. Uh, right. And do you think do you think Derek that the tower? Well, you know, we say tower, but. Really, the the uh, what do you call it? The ziggurat, ziggurat. probably is what yeah. it was. Um, was them? I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. Um, what's the alien movie with uh, Stargate? Geez. No, no, no. <laughs> well, we'll get to that too. But I didn't uh, know if that's where you were going with this. <laughs> no, it, Encounters of the something. Steven Spielberg movie, the old one. Oh, Close Encounters uh, of the uh, Fourth Kind. Close Encounters. So he, where he's he's molding out of the mashed potatoes, the mountain, yeah, yeah. you know, where he saw the aliens. Or do you think that was kind of like what was going on at Babel? They're like, we know that this mountain structure is where the gods came and met with the, you know us. They came from the uh, the heavens to the top of this mountain. Do you think that's what they were trying to recreate? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was common knowledge in the ancient world that gods dwelt on mountains. You know, mountains right. were the domain of the gods. They were remote. They were pristine. We humans don't live on those mountain tops, uh, so our grubby little hands didn't make them all dirty and messy. So, being right. being <laughs> gods, they get the best stuff, and yeah. that's why they were on right. those mountains. So, right. in fact, when Enlil took over as the king of the Pantheon, which happened during that third millennium BC. I just read an excellent paper a few months ago, and that really helped with the research from, for my book, The Second Coming of Saturn. Um, scholars had for a long time believed, based on the more recent writings from, uh, from Sumer and from Akkad, that Enlil was always the king of the Pantheon once he you know, took over from Anu. Uh, you know, Anu was off there somewhere in outer space, and Enlil was the only one who you know, had the, the frequency to contact him or whatever. But when a, a scholar did, did a dissertation on the history of, of Enlil and found a couple of things that were really interesting. First of all, the name, contrary to previous belief, was not based on the Sumerian words En meaning Lord and Lil meaning, you know, ether. Uh, they have now concluded or, or come to the, the, the realization that this is based on the uh, Semitic word Il, Il plus Ilu, meaning God of gods or God of all the gods. Now, the Semites didn't live in Sumer. The Sumerians spoke a language that was not Semitic, so that had to be imported into Sumer. The Akkadians spoke a Semitic language. The Amorites, who came in from the north and the northwest in the middle of that third millennium BC, around 2500, 2400 BC, they brought the worship of El, which is based on the same word, El, who was the creator god of the Canaanites, and the moon god called uh, Yarik by the Amorites, called Nana by the Sumerians, or called Sin by the, uh, the Akkadians, brought that worship into Sumer. Prior to the arrival of the Akkadians and the rise of uh, the Akkadian Empire under Sargon the Great, which was uh, around 23, 24, 
23 ish BC, um, Enlil suddenly took over as the god who um, gave kingship or bestowed kingship upon human rulers. Prior to that, it was Inanna. Inanna was the one who bestowed kingship onto human rulers. And now, this is some of the political ramifications of what may be a spiritual or supernatural struggle between these entities. So here, here's what I think went on, historically speaking. Sometime around 3100 BC, Nimrod, Enmerkar, and the Sumerian king list built this temple above the Abzu with the intent of opening a portal to the abyss because it was understood that these gods that they used to, you know, used to commune with humanity and taught us all this really cool stuff are now in the netherworld. One of the most fascinating discoveries that I made, well, one of the most fascinating things I learned, I didn't discover it, credit to the archaeologists who did the work, was that the Hurrians, again, those people who occupied kind of that northern fringe around Mesopotamia, had a belief as far back probably as 3500 BC that their chief god, Kumarbi, who was the equivalent of Enlil, El, Saturn, Kronos, etc., was in the netherworld, and they had to go into a ritual pit to communicate with him. This ritual pit was called the Abi, A-B-I. Scholars have now learned, just within the last 50 years, that Abi is actually where the Sumerians got the word Abzu, abyss, not the other way around. In other words, civilization and religion didn't begin in southeast Iraq in Sumer and spread northward from there. It came down from the north with the Hurrians, with the Amorites, with the Akkadians, the Sumerians. In some of their texts, they hint that their original homeworld was the region between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Guess what's there? The mountains of Ararat. So this belief that you had to summon gods from the netherworld to bring them up in order to ask them for favors is very old, goes back to prehistoric times, and probably because of the movement of the Hurrians and the Sumerians can be traced back to the, to the region around where Noah landed the ark. Jeez. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's mind blowing. So it this, is. this happened around 3100 BC. God saw it as important enough that he had to put a stop to it and confuse the language of the people who were trying to build it. Right. Do you think they would have successfully done what they were trying to do? Well, uh, I guess God, God kind of said that himself almost, but like nothing is going to be. Yeah. I mean, we can only speculate because we don't know. Yeah. God stopped right. it and he stopped it for a reason. Now, was he doing it just to teach them a lesson? It's like, look, stop it. And, but, but remember what we, we talked about earlier in Deuteronomy 32, after the Tower of Babel incident, he stopped the building, confused their languages, and then he divided the nations according yeah. to the number of the sons of God. And the belief was that he then delegated these lesser Elohim angels to essentially administer his creation on his behalf. Basically, what he was telling the people was, okay, you don't want to deal with me directly. Clearly, you want to deal with these lesser Elohim. Fine, I'll give you what you want, but you're not going to like it. In the same way, in the time of Samuel, the prophet Samuel, the people said, we want a king to be like all the other nations. And God said, okay, Samuel, give him Saul, but they're not going to like it. So I think that was the same thing that was happening. But then politically, in the spirit realm, you had this entity in the netherworld, Enlil, Kumarbi, El, Dagon, Molech, you know, it's same name for the same entity, for the, for, for this, different names for the same entity, um, inspired the Akkadians and the Amorites to bring his worship down into Sumer and Inanna, who I believe is one of this second group of Elohim. I believe she's still active and working in the world today. I mean, just, <laughs> just, just look around, you know, uh, since 2015, this explosion of teenagers who think they're the wrong gender. Um, anyway, Enlil convinced these people to make him the chief deity of Mesopotamia. His temple was at the city of Nippur, which ironically connects to the UFO phenomenon in a couple of ways. Um, number one, Zechariah Sitchin misunderstood the word because uh, it's sometimes transliterated from Sumerian into English, not as Nippur, but as Nibru. So... <laughs> Planet Nibiru. Planet Nibiru. There is no Planet, Planet Nibiru. Nibiru. It's a city in what was in, in, in ancient Sumer. Okay? And it's the location, it's the location of the temple of Enlil. Enlil's 
epithet, his nickname, was Great Mountain. Okay? Uh-huh. Great Mountain, and his temple was the e Kur, which means House of the Mountain, or Mountain House. And once a year, all the gods would convene at the e Kur and decide the fates of the land. The interesting thing is that in Sumerian, the word Kur can, can, uh, means mountain, but it can also mean netherworld. So in, in Great wow. Mountain can also mean Great Below. Wow. Now, here's the other way this connects to the UFO phenomenon. In Ezekiel chapter 1, he sees you know, this vision of the throne room of God with yeah. the, the living creatures that are around the throne, the cherubim, the cherubim, uh, yeah. with the four faces and the wheels within wheels with the eyes all around and the spirit of the living creatures is in them. But he mentions during that description that he was at the Kivar Canal. It's spelled C-H-E-B-A-R, but it's Kivar Canal. And he mentions seven other times in the book of Ezekiel that vision I had at the first over the Kivar Canal. Sharon said, you know, we need to look up where that is because he keeps mentioning it. So we looked it up. Guess where the Kivar Canal is? Oh, geez. It runs right through Nippur. Right ah. through Nippur. Ezekiel's vision of the throne room of God appeared right over the temple of the chief god of Mesopotamia. Bro. Wow. It's a nice poke in the eye, wasn't it? And then you go to Zechariah chapter 4, and that uh, verse that many of us have heard, and I want to read this out loud because I, I know people have heard the verse. I'd heard it a long time, and I'd never really heard the second part of the verse. Um, Zechariah is talking with an angel. He's got, having a vision, and he's speaking with an angel. Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? He's talking about the two lampstands that he's seeing. I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of Yahweh, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, we've heard that verse. I mean, that's a powerful verse. But the next verse continues. Who are you, O great mountain? Uh, Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. It, the, the Israelites had just come back. The Jews had just returned from 70 years in the middle of Mesopotamia. Do you yeah. not think they knew who the great mountain was? That is incredible. This is Enlil they're talking about. Yeah. This is Enlil. This is El of the Canaanites, who the Ammonites called Milcom, the Hebrews called Molech. This is who is being referred to right there. And because we we don't have the historical or, or theological reference uh, frame of reference of the Hebrew prophets. We right. we miss this. I was, oh, well, you know, Zerubbabel had a really hard job ahead of him, and that was the great mountain that God was going to level out for him. No! Right. Yeah. This was a message directly at the God worshipped by their pagan neighbors, the Babylonians, the Akkadians, the Chaldeans. Mm-hmm. And this is where we can see, like, history, archaeology, language, culture, all of these things are so important to really, truly understand the biblical narrative. I mean, if you now you can definitely God has grace. He loves people. He wants them to, you know, know him. So he doesn't make it super hard, you know, a kid, a childlike faith. But if you really want to understand the full story, all of those disciplines will give you, I think, a better, a wider view. Absolutely. Uh, it really, it really helps me appreciate the story so much more. Absolutely. You know, so much more context. Yeah. Man, mm. that, that is incredible. And I keep thinking too, like uh, I've, the whole time you're talking, I'm like, oh, that, that connects to this. Like I was thinking, right. You know, you were talking about Nimrod building the tower to, to, and, and uh, the, the rituals that are performed in the Abbey and all that stuff. Um, it makes me think, you know, is that what Moses was talking about when, when he told the children of Israel, don't say who will go up to heaven for us and don't go, you know, don't ask who will go, uh, across the water to, you know, and Mm. Paul quotes that in Romans when he's talking about Christ, he says, don't ask who will go up to heaven, you know, but Mm. that Christ has come to earth. So, uh, you know, like he's talking, he's gotta be talking about real things that they would have witnessed in that time and and things that they would understand. I mean, there's so many things that, that, that make more sense when you get this frame of reference. I mean, I mentioned the, the, the moon God scene was is how it's pronounced, but it's spelled S I N. You yeah. notice that when uh, the, the Israelites are, are fleeing Egypt, we're told that, uh, at the, the 15th day of the second month, um, they enter the wilderness of 
seen. And it was on that day they began to complain. It's like, we don't have any food. We're all going to die here. Um, but we think of it as, oh, it's the wilderness of sin. Well, this was a name that uh, maybe it was a really evil place. No, no, the wilderness of the moon god, the wilderness <laughs> of seen. And why, wow. why is the date mentioned? Because it's specifically the 15th day of the second month on a 30-day lunar calendar. Okay, the first day of the month is the night, that's no, the night of the new moon, where you see the first sliver of the moon. 30-day cycle, the 30th is the night of no moon, which means on the 15th, the moon is full. So they're entering the wilderness of the moon god, and the moon is full, and suddenly the people freak out. Ah. Uh, and of course, gosh. Moses got the law, and then Moses and Aaron, Aaron's two sons and the 70 elders of Israel, went up the mountain and saw God, ate a meal with him. Mount Sinai, the mountain named for the moon god. Yeah. What? Yeah. Wow. Bro. So, so it's kind of okay. like uh like where Heiser talks about uh the the arrow that flies by day and the the terror at night yep. and it's like those things, like we read over that stuff so quickly as right. as church people and we really have no idea what we're reading almost. Yeah. Well, you know, again, we've not been taught this. We've desupernaturalized yeah. the Bible yeah. to the point where you know really for about the last 1600 years with some exceptions, the work of Ryan Peterson has been really interesting because he's showing that from uh, 18th and 19th century Bible scholars that they understood that the the watchers of uh, the Hebrews, although they hadn't discovered most of the uh, the uh, Second Temple texts like the the Book of First Enoch yet, um, yeah. but they they understood that the sons of God in Genesis six were spiritual beings, spirit beings, and not the the righteous sons of Sheth. So there there have been pockets throughout history where. Uh, it's it's been understood, you know, the supernatural nature of the Bible has been understood, but especially in the 20th and 21st century, we Christians have just so desupernaturalized Scripture because we want it to fit in with the scientific culture that we live in. We don't want to look weird yeah. by saying yes, yes, we believe that there were giants who walked the earth, you know, long, long ago, and they were destroyed in this global flood that wiped everything out, except for right. the one family that was perfect in their generations. Um. And these uh, spirits of these giants were yeah. the demons that still afflict the world to this day. You know, right. they, they start looking at you with the, like, even in a lot right. of churches. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> the, the thing that, I, I, again, it just blows my mind. We start looking at the, 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 the history of the ancient world, look at where Jesus did certain things. And I know that there are more things in Scripture that we're going to find. It's just as time allows. I mean, you look at the focus that Jesus put on the Mount of Olives during the last week of his life where he divided his time between the Temple Mount, going and teaching in the Temple, and then on the Temple Mount, where he delivered you know, the Olivet Discourse. His longest teaching on end times prophecy was on the Mount of Olives. Uh, he made his triumphal entry from Bethphage, a little village on the Mount of Olives. He, uh, you know, Prior to all this, of course, he raised Lazarus from the dead at Bethany, which is on the Mount of Olives. Of course, that attracted a lot of attention. And the Gospel of John says the Pharisees and the scribes are trying to figure out how to kill Lazarus. Like, he was in the tomb for three days, you know, day four, he, he, he was well and truly dead according to Jewish law. And now you're going to try to kill him again. He was miraculously raised. You're going to try to kill him. But that was there on the Mount of Olives. And then he was betrayed, of course, in Gethsemane where he sweat drops of blood. That's on the Mount of Olives. According to John, when you look at the clues in John and Hebrews, he was crucified there and buried there on the Mount of Olives. First Peter three says he descended to proclaim to the spirits in prison and that phrase, who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. So he's talking about those sons of God from Genesis chapter 6. He descends into the abyss, and I love the way Mike Heiser puts this. Hey, guess you didn't expect to see me here, but here's a newsflash, boys. At dawn of the third day, I'm getting out, and you're still dead. And then, of course, he was seen by the women outside the tomb on the Mount of Olives. He was raised up into heaven from Bethany on the Mount of Olives, according to the Gospel of Luke. And Zechariah 14 says when he comes back, he lands on the Mount of Olives and splits it in half. Why is that relevant? Roll back the clock a thousand years before Jesus. Solomon, after he built the temple, was convinced to build a high place for Molech on the summit of the Mount of Olives. Molech, also known as El, Enlil, Asher of the Assyrians, Saturn, Kronos, Baal Haman, Dagon, whatever you want to call them, same entity. I think it's Shemiyaza, who was the leader of the uh, rebellious sons of God in Genesis 6. And 
suddenly he's got Solomon building a high place, a cult center, a temple on the summit of the Mount of Olives. And according to 2 Kings, that's why the priests refer to the Mount of Olives as the Mount of Corruption. If you've been to Jerusalem, there's a valley between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount, but the Mount of Olives is 200 feet higher, and it's east of the Temple Mount. So when you're opening the Temple of God, the doors to the Temple of God, and you look across the valley up on the hill up there, there's that high place for Molech, and there's a high place for Astarte, Ishtar, Inanna, right next to it. In Hebrew, that word mount of that phrase, mount of corruption, is har ha mashkith. But the word ha in Hebrew is uh, it's the definite article the. So why is it translated mount of corruption? Why is it not mount of the corruption? Because the corruption doesn't make sense when you do a search for that phrase ha mashkith. And this is why Bible software is such a great help. I don't read Hebrew. Um, you find that what it actually means is the destroyer. Har Hatmash Keith means mount of the destroyer. And I ran this past guys who do speak Hebrew, our good friend, uh, Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat. He said, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Kahn was like, yeah, uh, like, yes. Because when Jesus comes down in Zechariah 14 and lands, boom, that opens up. Who comes out of the abyss in Revelation 9? The king over those in the abyss. It's the destroyer. It's Apollyon. It's Abaddon. That's the, the same entity. And Jesus spent his, his entire ministry, essentially, beginning and ending, with messages directed specifically at this entity. Because again, it's El, the king of the Canaanite pantheon, or the creator god of their pantheon. His abode was on the summit of Mount Hermon, which makes sense if he's Shemiyaza, because that's where they came down and began the rebellion. And then at the end, Jesus crucified there, goes down into the abyss. Oh, you thought you won. Well, I got a newsflash. And then when he returns, so yeah, so (laughs) it comes back to what we said at the beginning. Yes, this stuff sounds fringe. It sounds weird, but it's based on the archaeology. It's based on scripture. It's based on the Hebrew text, the Greek text. And it just points to the fact that Jesus took all of this seriously. So if these gods are imaginary, then perhaps Jesus was misinformed. Mm. I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, and so correct me if I'm wrong. You might have, maybe I missed it. But when Jesus ascended into heaven and said, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, that would have been the Mount of Olives as well, right? Absolutely. So... And that, and that's what studying all this has done for me. You know, you hear the Great Commission, you know, win souls, make disciples, uh, you know, out, outreach in the community, show the love of Christ. And it, it kind of turns into a routine. And studying this stuff for me really woke me up to say, like, no, there's a war going on that you can't see that you have signed up for. You, you've you mm. become a part of it, whether you've you realized it or not. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's why I love studying this stuff. It really makes it real. Jesus wasn't just making this stuff up. He was, when he said, I have all authority in heaven on earth, he was talking about these guys. Right. Right. And, uh, I mean, it's we, 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 it, there are hints and things that, that pop up that suddenly jump out of the scriptures at you when you go through it now with these new eyes. And yeah. uh, it's like, was this here before? Like yeah. in yeah. Revelation four, when John is taken up in heaven and they're looking for somebody to open the seals on the scroll. And they say that nobody was found in heaven or on the earth or under the earth who was worthy to open the scrolls. Like, wait a minute, right. who's under the earth? Who's under the earth? Yep. Yeah. Man. Wow. Well, yeah. I, uh, There's a lot of stuff I in think here. You, that's, my mind that's, is yeah, like, I feel like, I, like and wish. I have so many questions now. It's like you, you answered so many of my questions. You, you said so many I, good things. I have a ton more that I could ask you, but <laughs> you know, yeah. We, uh, well, we want to be respectful of your time, but I definitely have a couple questions for sure. Uh, one thing that I like right off the top of my head that I've always thought about. Um, so the Bible says that Nimrod went on and built Nineveh. Mm-hmm. Um, so when Jonah comes along and, you know, God uh, has this Uber fish for him, you know, to pick him up and take him to Nineveh and he gets spat out onto the land by a giant fish. Do you think the Ninevites worshiped Dagon, who was the fish man? No. Or is and, that, no. No, and Dagon- Because I've, I've heard that before. And, and Dagon was not a fish god. 
That, okay. that's, that's a mistaken impression created by Alexander Hislop in his book, The Two Babylons, from 1860. And he meant well, but his research was not good, and he didn't have access yeah. to a lot of stuff that's been discovered since then. The last 160 years, scholars have found a few more things. Dagon was a, a grain god who was worshipped mainly before the Philistines showed up uh, in the time of uh, the judges, uh, you know, the time of Saul and David. The Philistines, uh, or rather the, uh, uh, the Amorites who lived along the Euphrates River between the border with Iraq today up to about the border of Turkey near the city of Raqqa. Uh, in ancient times, there was a city near Raqqa called Turka, and there was another one called Mari, M-A-R-I. That's near where the Syrian Iraqi border is today on the Euphrates River. And those were both cult centers for Dagon. Um, spelled in the time of um, uh, uh, Sargon the Great, you know, a thousand years before the judges, um, spelled D-A-G-A-N. Uh, later, the right. the pronunciation changed, so it's transliterated in the Bible with an O. But oh, um, no, he was a grain god, very much like Cronos. Uh, uh, you know, that's why he castrated his dad with a sickle. Uh, that's why Saturn's depicted with a sickle. The Grim Reaper has a sickle because uh, it's based yeah. on his character. Um, but no, that's who Dagon was. Um, and the, the fish that, that spat up Nineveh or spat up, uh, uh, Jonah, that was on the Mediterranean coast. Jonah had a long walk after he got coughed up because Nineveh wasn't near a river. They didn't, they didn't fish in Nineveh. So, uh, we, we make that assumption because of the way the story's been presented to us. Right. Because we don't, you know, look at maps. God bless, you know, Sunday school teachers, but uh, often don't look at, I mean, it's a sensational story. I mean, it's, right. it's a great one to remember. He was in the fish for three days. Ew. You know, yeah. a little flannel board Jonah, you know, being coughed out of a whale. But, but the fact is Nineveh was, was not really near uh, a river that would produce that kind of a fish that, that a human would live in. No, he had to walk from the Mediterranean coast to Nineveh. And probably grumbling the whole way because he wanted the Ninevites to oh my die. Gosh. Yeah. He he had about a three month walk to get to Nineveh from uh, from where he was coughed up. Goodness. Oh my gosh! Yeah, covered in uh, whale stomach acid. I wonder if it bleached his skin and his hair and stuff white. He probably looked <laughs> wild. Probably, yeah. <laughs> I remember I remember studying uh, Jonah a long time ago. I, I tell students that I teach, I say like, uh, man, the Bible is so much fun, like. When I was studying Jonah, I found myself, you know, two o'clock in the morning studying the the acids of, uh, <laughs> of, of the, the bowels of fish. You know, like uh, it's wild. Yeah, I mean, it, it's Nineveh was located close to modern day uh, Mosul, which is on the uh, Tigris River, and they've got a big um, dam that is uh, north of Mosul. That there was some concern that when the uh, Islamic State took it, that uh, they were having to operate the dam and it was going to fail. Thankfully, that didn't happen because Mosul would have been, it would have been bad. But um, yeah. yeah, just, the, there were just, the, the tigress just not big enough to support the kind of fish you'd need to swallow a human. Yeah. So wow. no fish, God, misinformation. Good yeah. question, Josh. But you know, yeah. the depiction of that, that, that fish God with the, you know, the cloak with the hat that just, yeah, they say the it looks hat, like the yeah. bishop's mitre. The Pope hat. Yeah. That was, <laughs> right. That was actually one of the Apkalu. That was, there were well, three, that makes sense. three types of Apkalu in the ancient world. One of them was that guy that had the fish cloak with the hat that, you know, looked like the Pope hat. Uh, there was another, it was a, a winged human. And then there was a third one that looked like a, uh, a humanoid, but with a, uh, like a, a, an eagle's head or a raptor head. Right, right, right. So yeah, those I've were the three, those. those were the three types of the Apkalu. Yeah. And he's holding the pine cone <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or whatever. That the pine is. cone in the little purse, <laughs> the little bucket. Yeah. The little, the yeah, little bag. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Or the battery pack or whatever they say on ancient aliens. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's so many dots that start to connect, I think, when you search all this stuff. And your research is, is unmatched, in my opinion. Where do you see these dots connecting maybe now and in the future? Well, I think we're seeing that this, this entity, Inanna, is really influencing the world. Inanna and Molech, or Enlil, or Saturn, um, I, I think have a, a, a game plan for the end. And we've been speculating about this in our unraveling revelation program, the, the weekly program we do on end times prophecy. And we can only speculate because we don't know what's in their minds. They're right, a lot right. older and a lot smarter than we are, but you can see the way genders have been twisted here in the last, just within the last 10 years. It's just been, it just incredible, yeah. almost unbelievable. Yeah. 
Um, I think that's the work of this, this spirit, Inanna, the spirit of the age. We, we see this, this glorification of the sexualization of children, this yeah. uh, deconstruction of gender. I mean, when, God, when uh, Jesus was confronted about marriage, he said, have you not read, created he them, from the beginning created he them male and female. You know, not male, female, and 57 other, you know, right. <laughs> in between that, that can f- fluctuate from day to day and change. And, uh, you know, that was not part of the part of the deal. They are being groomed and encouraged through social media. Uh, you know, kids should not be discovering their gender identity on TikTok. And yet that's what's happening. We're also seeing the influence of this, this entity, uh, Saturn, Kronos, Milcom, Molech, in the, uh, the, the death statistics uh, for the last four years running at least, based on what I could find, the number one cause of death worldwide is abortion. Now, Molech, of course, is the God who was known in the Bible for demanding children to be sacrificed, burned in fire. But the pagans of Greece and Rome knew that Saturn, Kronos, Baal, Haman, the Phoenician version of that uh, entity, also demanded child sacrifice. This was a known practice among the ancient Canaanites. There were Egyptian artistic inscriptions of battles where Canaanites were sacrificing their children on the walls while the Egyptian attackers were trying to scale the walls and get inside. Just like the story of uh, Jehoshaphat and uh, King Misha of Moab who sacrificed his son on the wall of his city. This was an, not an uncommon thing in the ancient world. Say Abraham didn't say, hey, Yahweh, what are you doing? You, know, you want me to bring my son Isaac? And, and Oh, okay, well, that's what the God wants. That's what you got to do. Because that's how they were in the ancient world. Now, the question I've been asked is, how is this entity, assuming he's so powerful, how is it that he's able to exercise this power when he's chained up in the abyss? I mean, both Peter and Jude say that those sinning angels are in chains in gloomy darkness until the judgment. How does a mafia boss or a gangbanger, you know, a gang leader, control actions on the streets when he's behind bars in prison? He's got minions. There is... There is A hint in Ezekiel chapter 32, which makes reference to the mighty chiefs in the midst of Sheol. The mighty chiefs is the the Giborim who are in the midst of Sheol, or the chiefs of the Giborim, if you will. Um, And it's clear when you read the Septuagint version of Ezekiel chapter 32, that it's the spirits of the giants, the Nephilim, who are being referred to in that text. Uh, the Septuagint is a version that was translated from Hebrew into Greek by about 200 BC. So using older Hebrew texts than the ones that were used to translate our English Bibles. So the Jewish religious scholars, 200 years before Jesus understood Ezekiel 32, dealing with these entities who, uh, what was the, the, the passage go? They, they caused terror in the land of the living, um, were being referred to as being in the midst of Sheol. But there's a reference to uh, Assyria, but the word is Ashur, and Ashur was the name of this entity, the chief god of the Assyrians. Unfortunately, because it makes it difficult to understand who's being referred to here, Ashur was the name of the chief god of the Assyrians. It was the name of Assyria, and it was also the name of their capital city. So you had to decide, you know, based on context, who's being referred to here? Is that the chief god? Is it Assyria? Well, in the Bible, it's almost always translated. Assyria or the Assyrian, except that that definite article, the, ha, Ashur, it's never there. It's not the Assyrian, it's Ashur. So I go into that in the uh, second coming of Saturn. It's somewhat speculative because maybe it refers to Assyria, but when the Bible says the Assyrian, that word the is not in the Hebrew text. It's not the Assyrian, it's Ashur. Does that mean this entity, Enlil? I think so. So you've got Enlil, or Asher, in the far reaches of the pit, while these mighty chiefs, these spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood, are in the midst of Sheol. I think that reference to the far reaches of the pit, in Hebrew it's Yarkate Bor, is a reference to what the Greeks would call Tartarus, which is where Peter puts the sinful angels of Genesis 6. They are cast down to hell, but the word in Greek is Tartarosis. It's Tartarus, it's not Hades. Right. And that's where the Greeks have the Titans, correct? Exactly, which is why I equate the sons same of thing. God from Genesis 6 with the Titans of the Greeks. Yep. Same wow. Thing. Hence same my, the title of my book, Last Clash of the Titans. Yes. Because according to Revelation 9, they get out for five months at the end. 
Mm. Yep. To get smacked down one more time. Get smacked yeah, down yeah, one more time. Yeah, yeah, get put back. That's good. And that's the thing that just blows us away is we were looking at, again, coming back to Godzilla, King of the Monsters, where they, yeah. are, re- they are referred to as the, the Titans. Titans. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. the original Titans. and rightful rulers of Earth. And then Monster Zero, mm-hmm. King Ghidorah. Oh, this was an intruder. He came from outer space. He's not supposed to be here. That's why Godzilla has to take him down. I, I think they're setting up a false understanding of what's going to happen in the end times. There will so be this whole thing is a psyop. This I, is a yes. That's what you oh, talk about in your book. Yep. I exactly. think so. Yep. I think yep. so. That's true. Mm. Yeah. A lot of, and I love I love what uh what Tim Tim Alberino says. Of course, we're we're avid Alberino fans as well. No, so are we. Um, his uh his trajectory of what's going to happen, the transhumanism movement and all that stuff, I think is really, uh, really exciting stuff. It's, yeah. it's wild. Well, speaking of Revelation 9, if you read the, in there, if the transhumanists get what they want, they're not going to be happy about it. Because when yeah. the Titans come out, they get five months to torment anyone without the seal of God on their foreheads and people will long yeah. for death, but death will flee from them. Yeah. Remember, death is Thanatos. That's the rider on the pale horse. Right. And he will flee yeah, from right. them. So they're going to yeah. they're going to achieve their their godhood and not be able to die when they want to. Right. Mm. Yowza, yowza, yowza. Man. <sighs> yeah, uh, so don't 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 give any shot that they tell you to get. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, come on man, you can't say, you can't say shot. <laughs> uh, we we got we got canceled on that one. We're still a baby podcast, Josh. Don't don't start down that road, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh um, man. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Just, I mean, just real quick, one other common thread that I saw in, in the the gods and the legends that you were mentioning is this idea that, um, like you mentioned, Kronos and Anu and these guys, um, that the the Most High God was kind of in the background. He right. wasn't, and and there was a god, a younger God, trying to overthrow him. I mean, is you know that is that what the devil's doing? He's trying to convince everybody that he can he can rule. He's the real. God or, you know, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's the, really what the, the storyline of history is that you got the sky God, who I think is the fake news version of the actual God, Yahweh, who again, after the tower of Babel said, okay, you want to deal with these lesser Elohim? Fine, but you're not going to be happy about it. I think that's how he's depicted in scripture. And that's why I think he's depicted as, as castrated, because if you're castrated, uh, yeah. you are neutered, you are powerless. So in the uh, the story, obviously, Kronos castrates his father, Uranus, with a sickle. Same story with Saturn and his fa- uh, father, Kalos. The Hurrian story, which was only discovered in the 1940s. The Hurrians, again, they're a much older people than the Greeks or the Romans. And they trace we trace their origin back through a very unique style of pottery to about 4500 BC on the plains of Ararat. Their sky god, also called Anu, was overthrown and castrated by Kumarbi, their version of Saturn, Kronos, and was also castrated, except that Kumarbi did it with his teeth, which is mm. disgusting. But Man. in every yeah, case, in every Can't case, say that. <laughs> in every case, this new king of the pantheon, Kumarbi, Saturn, Kronos, is overthrown by his son, the storm god. Teshub of the Hurrians is Zeus of the Greeks, Jupiter of the Romans, Baal of the Canaanites, same entity by different names. And Jesus in Matthew 12, beginning verse 22, where he's confronted by, uh, uh, you know, his, his enemies who say, well, you're only casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, which means Baal, the prince. Jesus said, if Satan casts out demons by his own power, how will his kingdom stand? Zeus, Baal, is Satan. Remember also in Pergamum, the letter to Pergamum, Revelation 2, Jesus said, I know where you live, where Satan dwells, where Satan's mm. seat is. That's a reference to the great altar of Zeus. Yeah, yeah, the Zeus, yeah. Storm God. Now, there was also the the, the temple of Zeus at the bottom of Mount Hermon, right? The yeah, temple of Jupiter, but uh, by the time of the Roman period, it was probably Zeus prior to that. Yeah, but and isn't, Pan, I guess. And, and temple to Pan. Uh, but isn't it interesting that at the north end of that uh, that that rift, that uh, the Beka Valley, which follows that uh, that rift that uh, goes right down through Israel, the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea, they're all on what they call the Dead Sea Transform. It's a fault line. The north end of that fault line is Baalbek, which was the temple oh, yeah. to Jupiter, but it was previously it was previously a temple to Baal. The largest 
temple to Jupiter, the king of the Roman pantheon in the Roman Empire, was in Lebanon, not in, you know, Rome. Why is that? There's something about that area, about that region, and specifically about Mount Hermon and the Temple Mount. Wow. Jeez. Well, I guess uh, we've we've gone a little bit longer than we typically do, and we like we said, I <laughs> think it. we said 20 minutes ago we want to be respectful of your time. So, <laughs> yeah, we appreciate you answering our questions. Well, happy but, to do it. Um, yeah. Just just to close, uh, if you could just you know say what what's something practical. You know, people who are learning about this stuff, or, or like we said, there's this war going on in heaven, and with all of the stuff going on politically and in Hollywood, and you know, these these elites, the globalists, whatever. How are how are we? How what practical things or or what can we do? How are we supposed to behave to to I guess watch out for ourselves and then to to you know affect the world around us? You know what what are we supposed to be doing in this time? Well, first of all, train up our children in the way they should go. Uh, because they certainly can't depend on the uh, uh, the public school systems to do it. Um, and, and I know that many Christian parents are homeschooling, but there are many who are in situations where they just cannot do it for one reason or another. Um, but you've got time with your children, both before and after school, to talk with them about these things and share with them these things. And I think if you can explain these stories to them and show them that the Bible is every bit as exciting as the Lord of the Rings, except that it's real, I think they will really begin to understand the nature of this conflict. The other thing is to don't be discouraged or downhearted. downhearted. We look at the, the, the world around us and the, the World Economic Forum and these, these guys who are pushing their agendas on us, whether it's, well, various agendas that are not biblical. Um, just remember, these people are fools because they think they're winning. They think they're winning. It's, they, they are unaware of the truth of the matter, which is that we Christians are running a different race. To their eyes, they think we're losing, but we are running a different race. Go to Psalm 2. Sharon, I, I give her credit for pointing me to this, because this really helps a lot when I'm looking at the daily news and just say, can you believe what they did in Congress today? She pulls me in off the ledge. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? They plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh, against the Lord, and against his anointed, his Messiah, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Money quote. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And now here's the future. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. That's where all of this ends. It may not be an easy path getting there. But again, we're playing the long game for eternity, not the game to see who's going to control Congress in 2024 or the White House or the United Nations or the World Economic Forum or whatever. That's temporary. All of that is going to go away. God looks down on them and holds them in derision. He laughs at them. And a day is coming where he's going to restore justice to this world. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Remember that. Right. Yeah. We've got the good shepherd behind us. And I, again, I credit Sharon for giving me this image because this is really powerful. The valley of the shadow of death. We've got the good shepherd behind us with a rod and a staff ready to administer a cosmic beatdown. So look, you principalities and powers out there, I'm not going to pick a fight with you, but if you're going to go after me, talk to the shepherd because he's right behind me. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Ooh, you got preaching there. Then take yeah. up an offering. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's great. Well, Man, again, I, yeah. credit my wife. She's the one who keeps me, uh, keeps me le- level. Yeah. Well, that's good. You got to have somebody do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, before we hang up, where can people, if they want to learn more about this stuff, cause I think that some people find this material overwhelming. They think I've been reading my Bible for years. I've never seen that. If yeah. they want to hear more from you or learn more about these topics, where, where should they look? Our website, the main website is gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org. We've got a weekly Bible study. Um, the easy way to get all the content, cause we put out about four hours a week, uh, between, 
my weekly podcast, A View from the Bunker. We've got another podcast. We've we brought back PID Radio now, so that's another hour of audio. That's two hours. Unraveling Revelation and the Bible Study. Um, but we've got a free app that is uh, available for iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle, Fire Phones, tablets. It's also good for Roku and Apple TV. So if you want to put it on the big screen directly, the app gives you a couple of other devices, or a couple of other uh, functions that's not available on Roku. Like there's a there's a Bible on the app. The developers of the app got like five different translations and they're all audio versions. So if you want to listen to scripture, you can cool. do that at the Gilbert House app and the app nice. is free. So you'll find the link at our website, gilberthouse.org slash app and uh, encourage people to get that because at some point I'll probably say something on my podcast that gets us kicked off YouTube. So uh, yeah, you never know, but the app, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that's awesome. Well, thank you again for your time and dropping all that knowledge. Uh, that's <laughs> so awesome. Good. So good. It, it, and this is what Josh and I, like I said, we, we started this, we're laymen. This is a hobby. We've been studying this stuff on our own time. So we love hearing from people who have been in the field, done the research. Um, you know, it, your contribution's invaluable. We thank you so much. Well, for you know, and this is just paying it forward because when Sharon and I started this back in 2005, you know, 18 years ago, almost exactly, this was us going to guys like Mike Heiser and Tom Horn and Ellie Marzulli and Steve Quayle and hearing from them, Stan Dale, you know, and they were they were willing to share with us freely. So if if uh, there's any benefit that comes from me doing this, well, you know, credit to them and then credit to God for allowing us to see these things because uh, yeah. it's it's just ripples spreading out on the pond and it all goes back to uh, it all goes back to Jesus. Well, Ryan, uh, my brain has exploded like I thought it would be, and this is your your brain that you got after Laura that, Sanger exploded. After, yeah, your, well, I got a new brain. brain, and then I got another brain, so this one's gone now. So now yeah. I got another one. No, that was that was incredible. The and amount of information that this guy has in his mind is incredible. Yep, yeah, it's amazing, and uh, this is what he does: he sits around and researches this stuff all day right. and, and puts it out on his own. Fantastic it, websites and, 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 and books videos, and videos and podcasts. And, yeah, he's been podcasting for that long. Yeah, I that mean, was really cool. So the dude has a ton of content. Uh, y'all go check him out, and maybe y'all start listening to him instead of us because we don't know half as much as he does. Yeah, but we're gonna, just kidding. <laughs> we're gonna have him back. So yeah, I'd love to have him back Definitely. on the show. Uh, what was it, Gilbert House? Yes. And uh, check out their Instagram. Check out their website. They do their Bible study podcast. He and his wife. Yeah, I think every week he said, didn't he? He's got like a dozen books. Yeah, books are good. Go get his stuff. Go find him. That was awesome about Godzilla. That was great stuff. I never thought about Godzilla being a, a psyop. Well, but... that's what's really cool is like taking what's popular in culture and merging the theology with it, getting the truth out of it, and yeah. do it so much fun. Uh, yeah, some more on that in the future for sure. Yeah. But for now, uh, you can find us uh, on Instagram, yep. at Behind the Curtain PC. Yep. That's kind of our main hub, but you can also find us on Twitter, which is... Yeah, uh, little, little rumblings on Twitter, which yeah. is uh, BTC Mysteries. Right. At BTC Mysteries. And we've got a YouTube channel running now, which is also going to be BTC Mysteries. Um, or you can search our full name, yeah. Behind the Curtain Mysteries of the Past and Present. But we're starting to... Uh, work on some video content so that we can reach that YouTube platform as well. Starting to branch out a little bit there, Ryan. Yeah, just trying a little bit. Entrepreneurial stuff. It started out as a small hobby and it's turning into a bigger hobby now. Yeah. So yeah, guys, if you have questions or uh, comments or whatever, just send it to us on Instagram or Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can message us. You can also email us if you like email. uh, Behind the curtain PC PC at at gmail.com. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And, uh, Next week, not sorry, not next week, but in our next episode, Mm -hmm. we'll be back to finish talking about Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. We're going to be in Genesis for a while, I think. We are. Well, there's a lot to cover. (laughs) There is a lot lot to to cover. cover. A lot to speculate on. I think Dr. Heiser actually said one time, he's like, I could devote my whole life to like studying Genesis and never be finished, Yeah, which is crazy. It's a fascinating book. But, you know, one day we may move on from Genesis and we have ideas on what to cover at that point, too. By the way, we... Uh, we said this earlier we love these guest episodes we have been reaching out to people looking for guests to come on the show and we would love to hear from you guys listening if you have a guest or a topic that you would like 
uh, us to have on the show, mm-hmm. please send us that information because we're always looking for feedback from our listeners. Definitely. Um, if there's a particular person that you're familiar with that you know has information on a certain topic yeah. or you want us to try to answer questions, we love doing Q and A. So uh, yeah, please interact with us. Please send us um, your you know questions or comments. We got, or we got a whatever. few things up our sleeve here, Ryan. I think I think uh, we got some good guests maybe yeah. lined up. So maybe what we should say is Fingers if crossed. you don't send us feedback, you're just at the mercy of whatever you're just we come have up to, with. Yeah, you're just gonna have to hear what we have to say. Yeah, but why so. not listen to a scholar that knows what they're talking about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or someone with more experience. Yeah, we got a lot we could say, man. Yeah. So in until then, uh, we'll we'll catch y'all next time when we finish Genesis ten and eleven, and then we'll we'll see where we go after that. Amen. Amen. Okay, y'all have a blessed day. Thanks for listening.